so I'm just getting back from from running right and when I was there I was thinking about they had the marches out here in North Carolina um, over the weekend for George Floyd and I was thinking about um, the, the African-American experience right and racism and it occurred to me how um, I think that we we as when I say we I mean we as black people and um, perhaps we as human beings have neglected the use of the other stick right so in um, child psychology right they have this idea um, of the carrot and the stick, right? When your kid does something good, you say, um, "Here's a, I don't know, a, a trip to Disney World, or or let's go, let's go to the pizza place, or whatever." And and then you have you have the stick, right? That when he does something wrong, you say, "You go sit in a corner and you think about what you've done." Um, that's what we do in America, in, in in Africa, where I grew up, they take a walk to you. Um, and then it occurred to me that in our interaction with white people now that's a very loaded term right um because i feel like in this conversation they're all our brothers and sisters who are caught in the middle but i'm going to ignore that for now in our interaction with white people we've had we've always used the stick right um you know um some asshole puts his knee on george floyd's neck and kills him and he's a psychopath and we get mad and we say man damn like how are you treating us white people and i feel like we never we never use the carrot Right? We never use the carrot. We never, we never say to Bob Dylan when as a 20, 21, 23 year old, right? He writes the ballad to Medgar Evers and um go listen to it, man. Like, go listen to it. Go listen to Bob Dylan singing about Medgar Evers. And if you close your eyes, you cannot believe that he's a white person. What I'm saying is that let us celebrate. Let us celebrate our white brothers and sisters because this is what we got, got to understand, man. I don't know. Maybe these exist someplace and I just didn't heard of them. But um, I haven't seen in African-American communities uh, one monument, one monument to one because there were white people who were ostracized by their communities and by their families because they stood up, right? Um, I know in my own interaction with some of my white friends, you know, like I have a friend whose, whose grandfather was taken to court because here in North Carolina, he, um, he leased his house to, to colored people in a neighborhood where he wasn't supposed to. Um, so this is like um, me saying, let's find a way to use the carrot, right? Yes, let's let's get let's you know go out there in our numbers and let us cry out for justice for George Floyd. But let us also pause and think whatever you believe in God, um, um, the cosmos, for those of our brothers and sisters who wake up, right? Can you imagine how hard it must be, right, to to come up in in the South? And to have your father uh, come back with blood spattered all over his shirt, and then he says that he says to your mother that yeah, we put down another nigger tonight, right? And then, and then you have to grow up and contend with this presence of someone that you love who has at work in him something that is that is almost indefinably evil, right? And when that young man cuts himself and breaks loose of those ranks and stands with us. Let us celebrate them, you know, let us celebrate them. I experienced the same thing in Africa when I was growing up, you know, um, after after the consciousness of the emancipatory potential of self-determination, right? Which is to say, after nation states started coalescing and, and um, and, and getting some identity for themselves, like in Ghana, you have Nkrumah, in, in Central Africa, you have Lumumba in, in, in you have um, Nyerere in, um, in Namibia and all these other places, right? And then we woke up and we threw down everything that had to do with quote unquote whiteness. So much so that we threw out um, our brothers, Gujaratis and Punjabis who had been in Central Africa for hundreds of years before the British got there. You should go read some of the literature on it. Um, this is what I'm trying to do as a black person, you know, and uh, it's really hard, right, to look at the places in my own consciousness where my understanding is fractured, right? Which is to say, to, to, to yes, point the finger at the man with a whip, but also see how me, an Ashanti, sees in my community the treatment of Northern Ghanaians in Ghana, right? The kind of language that is used about them, right? And all over. And so I think that as we wake up to the consciousness of hatred and racism and how, like, I've been trying to learn, man, you know, about, about all over the world. So there's a tribe, right, in northern India, 
And because Northern India is very close to China, there are tribes there that look Chinese, right? And if you saw them, you wouldn't know that they were Indian. And it's terrible, the atrocities that they experience in India. It's horrifying. So I think that, in a, in a sense, all of the cosmos, right, if you will, this whole idea of Gaia as, as Earth being conscious of itself, it is forcing all of us not to point the finger at Whitey and say that he done stood on the neck of the black man for 400 years, but for all of us to find the places in ourselves where brokenness still exists, because I cannot, as a black person in America, uh, go out, yes, and demonstrate and cry out for justice for Floyd and forget the kind of language that is used about Africans in America, right? Um, it's not it's not contentious at all. You can go on the internet and read about how Af some African American intellectuals speak about the African experience in Ghana. You know, um, sorry, the African the African experience in America, and um, it's it's messed up, man. It's messed up, and and unless right, that's what the man said, right? That the house that is divided against itself shall not stand. So I'm hoping that we can heal our divisions by healing all of our divisions, you know? So whatever you are, you know, whether you're Indian or you're Iranian or you're Palestinian or you're Israeli, you know, this thing is in all of us, it's in all of us, right? And another, another facet or dimension of this, right? So you think about it, right? The, again, the child psychology is fascinating, right? Because we learn so much. So when a child is born, it is terrified of long, slithery things. It cannot define what a snake is, but it is absolutely terrified by it, right? It knows that there's danger there. Now, the reason I point that out is that, and this is this is kind of like, I'm, again, as always, I'm trying to push a little bit to get to the very edge of my understanding. I feel the same way about the Black experience in America, right? So you have 400 years that has been drummed into the minds of some white people, unfortunately, that the Black man, that he is... He is, um, he is violent, he's irresponsible, he is um, incorrigible, he is um, uneducatable, if that's a word, right? Um, that, you, that you cannot do anything with a black man except whip him into obedience, right? And, and then you have Martin Luther King and you have um, even better yet Malcolm who comes out and then, and then there's you know, of course, long before them, Frederick Douglass and all the ones who've gone before, who proved that, no, there is, there is humanity here, there is great good here. The point I'm trying to make is that I think that um, it becomes very, very difficult without, again, meditation and self-awareness to not yield to the instinctive response when you encounter a Black person, right? So I've noticed out here that I would go out, right? I go out real early, like I leave the house at 5.30 to go out and work out in the park. And I noticed that when it's very early, right, um, when other uh, white people are jogging and they lift their heads and then, you know, they wear these torches on their foreheads, right, and it falls on me that I see the momentary seizure, right, in their, in their consciousness before they relax. If there's, if there, I've seen some of them cross over to the other side, right? I don't think it's racism at all. I think that it's just... Um, it's just a, a certain kind of alertness. It's the same thing that makes a child terrified of uh, long, slithery things before it knows that it's venomous and it's a snake. You know, that's why we all have a fear of failure um, and we all have uh, a fear of falling, right? <clears throat> there, are, there are these um, almost um, congenital, if you will, um, things that we carry as a consequence of human experience, right? So what I'm saying is that some way, somehow, we have, call it epigenetics, call it uh, genetics, whatever it is, we have been able to record in the human genome an awareness that if you see something that is uh, wiry or stringy and it slithers on the ground, that it's dangerous, right? You can go watch videos of it, right? Um, and how children have this instinctive reaction not to touch grass, right? Um, what I'm saying is that over the years, I think that it has been drummed into white consciousness in ways that are that are subliminal, that are subconscious, that um, it's a terrifying thing to be exposed to a to a black person or a colored person uh, without without the presence of protection and security and defense. And so, whenever 
there's this interaction between a white person, generally speaking, right? Um, I know, of course, there are many people like Bob Dylan who transcended, but we, we got to understand, right? It's kind of like everything else. You're going to find that there are, you know, a handful of people who are seven foot, and then um, there's me, right? <laughs> and, and all the rest of us. So um, the point I'm trying to make is that we have to be kinder to racism, right? Um, what does that even mean? What I mean is that we have to we have to think about the evolution of racism, right? We have to go a little deeper and to understand that when this woman is is, is jogging at five thirty a.m. and he sees this black guy and he's jogging towards towards her, all of a sudden, all the record of grandparents, right? Um, and again, like this is like it sounds like pseudoscience, but it's not, right? There are studies in Sweden where we can trace the health of great grandchildren by the starvation of their great grandparents. Okay, so um, don't think it's weird at all. If you read the literature, it's it's perfectly understandable that if you come out of a background where these ideas have been believed and they have almost been institutionalized, right? Um, read William Faulkner, right? Read William Faulkner. It's beautiful. It's incredible how he catalogs the understanding, even of the most generous people, that the black man is one step removed from a mule. Yes, you can talk to him, but you can certainly talk to your dog sometime. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that I am pushing the envelope a lot, and I am asking a lot of myself and all of us because it's hard, man. It's hard. It's kind of like meditation, you know, you're sitting down there and um, you you feel this itch coming on on your knee and you know that it's it's just there to distract you from, from staying focused, but it's so strong, right? And so I'm asking us to not be too quick to label racism in the world, right? Let's not be too quick to label racism. Um, there's a lot uh, that is labeled evil, which is just ignorance masquerading as evil, right? Um, we can we can explain a lot in the world by by just the evil that is in the hearts of men, evil that's in the hearts of men, and again by this um, call of genetic experience, right? That is uh, drummed in and in until a person can no longer see it, right? Can no longer see it, right? Here's my personal story. Um, my grandfather had a cocoa plantation, right, in Ghana, and and he would get laborers, right, and from northern Ghana, and then they would come and they would work on his plantation. And and it was terrible, right? Um, this was this was in Africa, you know. There were black people, and they were just of a different tribe. So what I'm saying is that um, this thing that is always seeking to hedge itself, right? It goes back. It goes back to Freud and to Eric Fromm and to the psychotherapist, and then they say that all of us, some way, somehow, we need to define the boundaries of safety and security, right? Um, and and I think that this is only a stage in human evolution, right? Um, we're, we're a very young species, you know, like we, we haven't been here a long, long at all in terms of the development of consciousness. Um, I mean, if you read the Upanishads, right, and the Bhagavad Gita, like those people, they, and this was like thousands of years, right? They have gone past where we should be now, right? Some people, at least, right? They were aware that this skin and this body, that it's nothing, that it's nothing, it's, it's Maya, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's a masquerade, it's an illusion, right? And and I know this intellectually, but it's hard for me to see it in the world, right? To go out and see a Japanese man and not imagine that he is, in a certain sense, different from me, right? Um, on the surface and culturally, obviously he is, but really he's not. That That's the lesson of Eastern mystical tradition and um, what we learn from it. And eventually we're going to get there, man. Um, I have met and know wonderful um, white people. And so uh, this is me uh, celebrating some of them, right? This is me trying to do a little bit of what I ask, uh, what I'm asking my family, my friends, and the people that I love to do, right? Um, all of these people, too numerous to mention, right? Ed Roncardi and Donna Roncardi, uh, who I met at uh, in Virginia, in Alexandria, right? Um, beautiful people, just, just, just beautiful people, man. And um, and I'm grateful for them, and I'm grateful for uh, all the artists, right? All the artists, like I said, um, go and listen, go and listen to Bob Dylan in the '60s, man. And um, yeah, me, I have, I want a huge poster of Malcolm on the wall, like you know, like blown up to cover the whole wall. And the opposite side, you know, the image that's going to be there, a picture of Bob Dylan, okay? 
there's going to be a picture of Bob Dylan on the other side of my wall. Why? Because they both stood up for truth and courage when it was when it was a death sentence, right? When it was a death sentence. Um, so let's be aware that um, some white person is going to recoil in horror when when she opens her door in the parking lot and you are there and uh, she's having a very stressed out day and you see this response of shock and hatred that rises up to the surface and you're thinking, man, when is this racism going to stop? And I'm just saying that um, we have to give it time. We have to give it time. And you see how much time, Charles, how many more George Floyds and how many more Trayvon Martins and how many more of, of our brothers and sisters are going to be murdered. Um, I can't answer that, right? Um, some of my friends hate to hear it, but it's an imperfect world, you know? It's an imperfect world. Um, some asshole is going to keep taking a brother's life. I don't know, maybe tomorrow, some asshole is gonna take my life. And if they do, um, I hope that when you're dealing with that asshole, that you remember to be merciful because he also is the product of instinctual responses that have been conditioned by fear and aggression. And these instinctual re responses are uh, just like bacteria, just like a virus, you know. Um, you've seen the video, right? This man, he kneels on this man's knee, on this man's neck, and, and he cannot breathe and he's killing him. And... Um, and he's not terrified. He's not, he's not even angry, right? He's not even angry. He's just stamping out an ant, right? He's not even angry. It's not like, you know, um, yeah, he's swatting away a fly, almost sort of, um, and it's terrifying. Uh, but, so, but so that we, we kind of, again, like we extend the limits and we broaden the limits of our generosity and we say, um, here, is, here is a brother over there, right? And... Um, Thomas Sowell says something that's very powerful, right? Um, he talks about how you have, um, what you call it, uh, affirmative action, right? And you go to these places and you have busing and you have these forced integration of the schools and you go into the schools and the black kids all go sit in the corner and the white kids all go sit in the corner. That's how you know that that's not the way you solve the problem, right? That is not the way you solve the problem because if it was, the white kids and the black kids would be sitting together. What I'm saying is that the way the lines are drawn right now, you're going to end up where all the black kids are sitting in a corner and all the white kids are sitting in a corner and we cannot have that. Um, it's unhealthy, it's unstable, and we begin to believe all kinds of garbage about each other. Uh, so uh, the point again is that we have to recognize that the way that we um, bring true integration and true understanding is to again broaden and increase the limits of our generosity, right? Um, if you have a white person in your life as a black person who is wonderful and kind and beautiful, introduce him to your other black friends, right? And then maybe he can introduce you to some in his family who hate black people or whatever, right? Because this is where the barriers are broken down, right? If I'm sitting here listening to this rhetoric and our Sharpton is, is, is doing his thing, right? Um, it's... Yeah, it's it's not healthy. It's not healthy. I don't think it is. So, um, yeah. In short, let us understand that we have we have a duty and a responsibility to be self-reflective. You know, to be self-reflective, to find out in ourselves, in our own hearts, as Black people, where because this thing, right? <clears throat> this hatred is like a current, right? Um, it's kind of like Jordan Peterson's uh, attack on on Marxism, right? There is no. There's nothing that says that you are a good person just because you are poor, right? And there's nothing that guarantees us your honesty and sincerity just because you are uh, the proletariat, right? And so we have to understand that just because we are oppressed, it doesn't mean that we have overcome because we have a lot of overcoming to do. And the greatest battle is not the one that lies outside of us, right? The greatest battle is the one that lies inside of us, right? is the one that lies inside of us because you see, if you are not too careful and you listen to our Sharpton, you imagine that the greatest battle is outside in the world, right? That some way, somehow, if we could convince our white brothers and sisters to love us, that we'll be cool. And um, the record shows that we won't, right? That is what Walter Williams' studies uh, teach us, that um, that's not where the greatest victories can be won. And so let us all turn this into a time and a season of reflection, not, um, not picking at the old wounds and the old scars and, and pulling out, you know, the pictures of battered Medgar Evers and all of it. Um, um, maybe sure, right, to remind us of, of how far we've come. But um, I say all this and to add to it that for me, right, as a black person, 
that America is a miracle, man. Um, and this is from somebody who has no illusions about the struggles here, right? Um, I have also encountered the the ridicule and I have encountered um, the people who look at you funny and the people who step out of the line um, if you're in front of them and they create an excuse like they, they went to pick something and then you see them join the line at a different place or whatever, right? Like so-called microaggressions. I don't know, it doesn't bother me, right? <laughs> Nobody's lynching and hanging me. And um, maybe you say, that Charles, that's not enough. We, we got to demand more. We got to demand respect. I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, I haven't earned anybody's respect until I have I have um, found the courage to validate in myself um, something that is worth respecting, right? And um, that is what I want to work on. And so I also want us as Black people to be grateful for America, right? And and I have a friend who wants to turn the blade in my back when I say this, right? Um, but America is beautiful, man. America is beautiful. I go out here at the park and and I see. Um, the Venezuelans and the Ecuadorians, and I see the Chinese, and I see um, the Japanese, and I see all of them, all of us come out to this land. Why? 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 Why this place? Why this place? Why this place? It's, it's just another place, right? Like Australia or Germany or whatever. But for me, America has become the place where the human experiment has been the most advanced. Right. In America, more than any place else, men have tried to look firmly in the mirror of consciousness. And I think about America like I think about science. Yes. At one point in time, there was some French dude who was measuring the heads of black people and making a case in the scientific journals that um, he's demonstrating the closest similarity between blacks and monkeys. And and that time that was science. Right. Um, phrenology and, and all the garbage that that is. But. The hope of science is that it's self-correcting, right? That it's self-correcting, that eventually somebody gets up and says, um, hold up, uh, yeah, that paper you wrote, um, it's actually garbage. It's not science at all, right? Um, that's what I feel that America has the potential uh, to be and, and has always been striving to be, right? Uh, I know how laughable it is to, to write letters to the British Crown and say that you are taxing us without representation and 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 whilst you're writing that letter, every time you lift your head, there are these um, coloreds on your plantation and some of them have scars on their back um, from from your whiplash, right? And, and And how completely like, unconscionable that is but but then america corrects itself right just like a scientific experiment and then it wakes up to to its own brokenness and then it says that let us fix it let us do something about it so um that is why i, I applaud america that is why i'm grateful for america and that is why i um i recognize also that we we have as black people in america uh, an opportunity to be a part of this great human experiment this great human experiment and um sometimes um, to advance science, you are the rat in the cage. And um, thank you for helping us cure cancer, but um, your, your suffering, right? The experiment in Tuskegee and uh, Indian brothers and sisters on the reservations, right? That was part of the American experiment. That is the quote unquote cost of doing science. And um, as completely um, psychotic, right? As that may sound, um, it, it has been the cost of human advancement all over the world, right? Um, I say it all the time, I'm Ashanti. There was a time when uh, in the Ashanti kingdom, when a king died, they would corral some of the slaves and they would slaughter them like pigs, right? And bury them with a dead king so that they would go and serve him in the underworld, right? I am looking in the mirror, right? Now, there's somebody who says that, hey, you are out here uh, uh, hanging our dirty linen uh, in the open. That's who we are. That's who we were, right? And, um, and we woke up and we discovered that it wasn't right. Right? And it's nothing to be ashamed of because our brothers and sisters, right, in, um, in Tenochtitlan, uh, they also uh, sacrificed 10,000 people so that the sun will rise, right? Um, and it never occurred to them. Nobody had the courage to say, yo, um, y'all hold up. How about we don't kill these 10,000 people and wait if the sun gets so pissed off that it don't show up tomorrow, <laughs> right? Um, so um, anyway... Uh, just just uh, something to think about in these kind of troubled times.